Welcome back to Closing Arguments. I'm Michael Ayala. In tonight for Vinnie Politan, the search for four-year-old Cody Bigsby in, has, been an ongo has been ongoing since his father, Corey Bigsby, reported him missing in late January from their Hampton, Virginia home. Now, Corey told police he woke up on the morning of January 31st and his son was nowhere to be found. Corey Bigsby has been identified as a person of interest in the disappearance of his son. He has been charged with seven counts of child neglect stemming from incidents prior to Cody going missing and unrelated to this case. He appeared in court Tuesday and was denied bond. Penny Mitt from our great affiliate WTKR has more on this story. Tensions and emotions very high inside of the Hampton courtroom today where Corey Bigsby, the father of missing four-year-old Cody Bigsby, was denied bond. But that decision did not come quickly. It came after over an hour of arguments. Now, no cameras were allowed inside the courtroom, but we can show you some footage from that initial bond hearing. If you remember from back in February, Corey Bigsby was denied bond after it was discovered he had an AWOL conviction in the military and was said to be a flight risk. Well, that was discussed again today with Corey testifying that it was due to a miscommunication between his higher in command and following a four-day weekend when he was job hunting for life post-military. Commonwealth attorney Anton Bell then discovering Bigsby was actually gone for three weeks and in the United States for part of the time he was supposed to be in Germany. Anton Bell also noting Corey Bigsby's previous assault and battery charges in 2018, as well as the possibility of obstruction of justice. Bell argued if Corey is released, he may try to tamper with evidence related to the disappearance of his son, Cody. Combine these three arguments and Judge Savage, who you may remember was brought in after all of Hampton's judges recused themselves from the case, denying Corey Bigsby bond, saying he's a flight risk and a risk to the community. We caught up with Corey's aunt after court. He done nothing wrong. Do you believe he's a risk to the community? He's not a risk to the community. He's been there here all this time and ain't harmed nobody. Also discussed inside the courtroom today, the mishandling of Corey's interrogation by Hampton Police and the FBI. Bigsby's lawyer, Jeff Ambrose, recounting hours of interview footage from the days leading up to Bigsby's arrest, stating that Bigsby was in HPD custody for 72 hours despite not technically being under arrest and after asking over and over again if he could go home. 62 of those hours were after he asked for an attorney and was ignored. Jeff Ambrose also described evidence that Corey Bigsby was denied sleep, was told to put chairs together to use as a bed, and was psychologically pressured. From Hampton, Penny Commit, News 3. All right, let's bring in tonight's guest. Joining me in Salt Lake City, Utah, private investigator Jason Jensen. In San Diego, California, retired director of the San Diego Police Department Crime Lab, Jennifer Shen, and in Hampton, Virginia, Commonwealth Attorney Anton Bell is with us as well. Thank you all for being with me tonight on the show. Anton, I'll begin with you. As we're in that courtroom today. It was all about that hearing and that uh, bond hearing. But before we get to that, I want to start off. During that hearing, you did mention that Cody is missing and presumed dead. Any updates at all you have? I mean, that's what this is really all about. It's about Cody and finding him, figuring out what happened to him. Any updates at all on the search and investigation into his disappearance? Uh, well, first of all, good evening, Michael. Uh, what I can share with you is that um, so many avenues were exhausted concerning the search for Cody. Uh, he is a four-year-old who, according to his father, disappeared in the middle of the night and just went outside in the snow. And there's no evidence to uh, confirm that or even to corroborate that. And as you can well imagine, that was back in January of 2022, January 31st. We're now here in the first week of April and there's absolutely no signs of him. Um, it's just in legal law enforcement uh, when we know we go this long and there has been absolutely no sign of a life of the person in which you're looking for, particularly at this young age, there's ten, there is a tendency to believe that that person is deceased and everything right now that we have found thus far is pointing in that direction. Mm. All right, now today's hearing, let's get to that. Um, some of the things that were argued at that hearing were outlined in that piece uh, that we saw, but I want to check in with you. And um, you made the arguments that he should not be released. You talked about the seriousness of the charges. 
Uh, you talked about some previous charges, also some issues uh, with the uh, armed forces as well. Outline some of the things that you argued as to why uh, Corey should not have been released into the community. So under Virginian law, when you are determining whether a person is eligible for a bond, there are several factors that be, can be taken into consideration. The two main factors are whether that individual is a flight risk and whether that person is a danger to the community. And so the defense obviously uh, try to offer to the uh, court that uh, Mr. Bigsby was not a flight risk or was a danger, and they tried to bring up his uh, military background and his career, stating that he, he had a stellar career. I was able to obtain his military history, and I was able to show the court through his military history that not only did he not have a stellar career, but he, it, his career involved the AWOL and it was at the very, very end of his career. And so they allowed him to go ahead and retire. However, uh, during the evidence, it was shown that instead of this individual saying that there was a miscommunication with higher ups and it was only a four day weekend, he was actually missing for more than three weeks. And while they thought that he was in Germany, where he was stationed, he was actually back in the States in New Jersey and had been there for quite some time. In addition to that, when talking to his commanders, uh, he stated that he was currently in Germany with his wife celebrating, a, I believe it was a birthday. And the facts from that um, AWOL hearing showed or determined that he actually caught a flight from McGuire Air Force Base days later. Uh, so it was it was no way in the world that he was actually in Germany. So it was a, um, a few things in his military background that we were able to show that this is a person not only that would not obey commands and would not obey court orders if given. However, he, he had this deceptive background and this manipulative background and all those things were brought out in court. Now, Anton, there were also some disturbing allegations made by his attorney about the interrogation, uh, the amount of time he was in there, the way he was treated, being denied counsel. I'd love to get your response to that, and, and how do you think that might affect the proceedings going forward? Well, here's the thing. The, the issue concerning uh, how he was treated and what the officers did or did not do, those are issues for suppression. And so if they can show that he, um, the statements that he gave that in some way will show guilt towards some of these, these charges that are before the court were not made voluntarily or knowingly or intelligently, they, or if he asked for an attorney prior to those statements being made, then obviously they will not be able to come in and a court will suppress them, which we have no problem with that. Here's the problem. The problem is he was read his Miranda rights and he did wave and all of those things were caught on video. So it's not the officer's word versus uh, his word it is all on video. So you, you, you can't you know deceive that part. And in addition to that, any statements that he made prior, any statements that we plan to use uh, came prior to him invoking and asking for an attorney. And um, I know he detailed like they, they had been in there for you know many, many, many hours. But when you go through the timeline, you can see that the majority of the statements were made somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 hours or less uh, in the custody of the police department and the FBI. So uh, they have a hard uh, hill to climb in reference to that. So we, we feel pretty confident that we'll survive a suppression hearing. All right, now you talk about statements. The only statements as far as the public knows that he's made uh, are that the child left the house in the middle of the night and that's all he knows. Are you suggesting there are other statements here that could incriminate him in some way? There are statements that incriminate him concerning the charges that are before the court today. I gotcha. Okay. All right. Um, now, th the other thing is now, right now in the investigation, uh, I think you stated as such that he's the only person of interest uh, in this investigation. Um, why is that? And, and do you have something that suggests he's the only one? And, and what's in your power to perhaps get him to talk if you believe truly that he knows something about what happened? Now that part, Micah, unfortunately, I cannot disclose at this time. 
because it's still an ongoing investigation and they are still uh, looking into other leads involved in this case. So unfortunately, I can't go into details concerning that. But I will say, given the fact that, and, and this is public information already, we know that um, this defendant is the last person to see Cody Bixby alive. And that's our belief. And that is the theory in which we believe the evidence supports. And so as a result of that, that's why he is a person of interest. All right, let me bring in my investigators here, Jason, Jen Jason Jensen and Jen Shen. Say that four times fast. Um, Jason, let me start with you. Um, you heard the situation here. They believe he is the one. He was the last person to see them alive. But there's no real trace yet of, of, of Cody. And, and where do they go from here in terms of trying to figure out what might have happened to him. Right, right. Um, typically, when you're investigating the disappearance of a child, there's basically three categories that you look at. You're either considering it as a child abduction or a wander off, or in many cases, death and concealment. So uh, clearly the evidence, given the fact that this was winter time, you didn't find some toddler wandering around. There wasn't footprints in the snow. So, you know, whether someone broke in the house to abduct this child, certainly uh, Cody uh, would have uh, alerted somehow. C Corey would have noticed somebody coming in. So clearly, I think it, by process of elimination, we're down to death and concealment. And it does happen. And when you have a father with a history of child neglect, it's entirely conceivable something happened while he was absent from the home or the child was out of his sight that he panicked and did something to conceal his child. So Anton Bell, you're fairly sure that this is not a case of uh, an abduction, for instance, that in fact maybe the child did wander off and then was perhaps abducted. You're fairly uh, clear that that is not an avenue you need to be chasing. I'll just say this, Michael, the evidence does not point in that direction. The evidence points in other direction and it has been pointing towards the father. Jen Shen, I, I would imagine if there was some sort of abduct, abduction, uh, there would be evidence of that that they could find. It was a winter night. I guess there was snow on the ground. There would be places they could look to verify that uh, and this idea that they really have honed in on the father. I mean, talk to me about how that sort of evolves and how you eliminate these other roads, these other possibilities. Well, when you go in to evaluate a crime scene as a scientist, you have to keep everything open and on the table. So we, we do not let ourselves be biased by whatever situation uh, witnesses might have said, a suspect might have said. So you go in looking for any clue of any kind. So if you're looking at an abduction, you're right. If someone came into the house, broke into the house, went into his bedroom and took him, then you would expect to see some kind of, of evidence of some sort, whether that's shoe prints or tire tracks or cars coming up to the house, which you could maybe perhaps catch on video, et cetera, or some kind of disruption within the room itself, uh, hairs, fibers, you know, saliva, blood, anything. There could be so many things that could be left behind if you go in and get a child out and take the child out. Now, it can be done and has been done. Um, there are cases where someone breaks into a house, takes out a child, and they don't have anything uh, to lead them to a specific suspect. But if you have an absence of anything that would point to that, then you're naturally going to look at the next option, which would be that the child wandered off or the, the, the death and concealment, which certainly does seem like the likely scenario here. All right. So, Anton Bell, I mean, you're pretty clear. It looks like you're very confident he was the last person seen with the child. So the only thing I can think of, again, you may or may not be able to answer this question, is... Maybe there's a witness. Do you have a witness who saw the child with him? Uh, that gives you that kind of confidence to say he's the last person seen with him? Well, I'll say this, um, and, and this is something, again, that's public information, so I don't mind sharing it. Uh, in his statement to the police, his, his initial statement to the police is that he was the last person to see Cody and that Cody um, woke up around two something in the morning and said that he wanted to go outside and play in the snow because it had snowed that weekend. And his father told him, no, uh, go back to bed. His bedroom is upstairs. 
the father said that he fell asleep on the couch downstairs. Mm -hmm. So anyone who would have broken into the house, now remember, this is a military veteran Mm -hmm. of more than 20 years, a sergeant in the military. Anyone who would have broken into the home would have had to pass by that father and not only pass by that father once, but pass by that father twice to go upstairs and then come back with a child, a child that does not know him, and go outside. And there were no footprints or no fresh imprints in the snow when the police and the detectives arrived on the scene. So there, and and that's just a little bit of it, but just to kind of give you a little um, open window into some of the things that we were able to clearly um, uh, uh, see and and, and, and kind of get a, a, a clear undertaking of what was going on. All right, and finally, in the last little bit of time we have left, uh, what's next for Corey at this point? So we have a preliminary hearing, which is uh, in Virginia probable cause hearing for a determination of whether this case or charges are gonna go towards the grand jury for indictments. And if they return true bills of indictments, then we will try him. And there's also the potential of new charges that may come forth as well. So right now, this is still a very fluid situation. And again, because the investigation has not ended because we have not found Cody. So that's not going to end, that's gonna continue. And so if uh, more evidence should um, be uh, uncovered, then we will at that point make decisions and determination as to how to proceed legally. All right, let's hope we find this little boy one way or the other, bring closure and let everyone know what might have happened here Um, and and bring the right people to justice at the end of the day. Big thank you to Anton Bell for joining me this evening. Truly appreciate it. We really appreciate your time and hope that you'll come back and speak with us again soon. Jason Jensen, Jennifer Shen, you're going to stay with me because when we come back, it'll be time to 